Hello, I'm Zuhor Youssef, the Learning and Events Associate here at CEREC, and on behalf of CEREC, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Because of, this last, because of a last minute obligation, Dr. Jan Stewart is unable to make today's webinar, but she was gracious enough to record an introduction that we will play for you just shortly. Of course, we are delighted to have two members of the Bridging Two Worlds research team. Um, they are Kirby Bogart and Carrie McCluskey. They will be sharing their research and the resulting best practices learned in supporting culturally responsive career development for newcomer and refugee youth. Before our presenters get started, I would like to take a few moments to introduce you to CEREC for anyone who may be unfamiliar with us. CEREC is a charitable organization that focuses on education and research and career counseling and career development in Canada. We fund research and advanced knowledge in the field, like the research you'll be hearing about today. Bringing you learning opportunities like this webinar is also a key part of our mandate. CEREC has three main programs, the Connexus National Career Development Conference held in Ottawa each January. We also have our contactpoint.ca website, which is a free online community for career development professionals, and the Canadian Journal of Career Development, which is also a free to access resource. We can learn more about, you can learn more about all of CEREC's good work at CEREC.ca. Now let's address some key housekeeping items. If during today's webinar, you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box you see on your screen. Kirby and Kari will also be responding to them towards the end of the webinar. And at the end of the webinar, we will email you slides as well as the recording of the webinar. We also encourage you to engage with this webinar on social media using these popular Twitter hashtags you see on your screen. All right, and a little bit about our presenters. Jan Stewart is a professor in the Faculty of Education at the University of Winnipeg. With over 30 years of learning, teaching, and field experience, she is the author of a number of publications, including the book that is the evolution of the study of bridging two worlds. Kirby Bogart is a program manager at Needs Inc., a nonprofit agency that works with refugee kids, youth, and their families. She's completing her master's in peace and conflict studies. Kari McCluskey is a Lost Prizes coordinator and the contact faculty at the, fac the University of Winnipeg Faculty of Education, where she works to provide professional development and training for pre and in-service teachers. I will now turn it over to our two presenters, but before I do, there's a quick introduction from Dr. Jan Stewart. Hello, I'm Dan, uh, Jan Stewart from the University of Winnipeg. I am a professor in the Faculty of Education. I have been working in the area of refugee education and trying to help people who are from refugee backgrounds for over 15 years now. I'm a former educator in the public school system and now a researcher and counselor educator and teacher educator in Winnipeg, Manitoba. And my research has spanned um, around the world, really, when I've worked with teachers in post-conflict situations. So we have a reciprocal type learning arrangement where I will go to different contexts and learn with them, and they will come as well to our context and help us help the teachers be more prepared here in Winnipeg. In terms of the study that I've been doing with, with CIRIC and SHIRC and MITAX over the past three years, um, we decided that we had fairly good background on the challenges and psychosocial issues affecting newcomers and students who have refugee backgrounds. But what we really wanted to take a look at was what are we doing well in Canada? And maybe not from the perspective of Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, but taking a look at some of the smaller city centers and seeing, you know, what are we doing in places like Winnipeg or in Calgary or in Charlottetown and just trying to learn from uh, what different models there are out there in terms of supporting and also building capacities with teachers. So our research that we did was taking a look at what are the best practices for supporting newcomer and refugee children in the classroom and in the community, and how are we going to build more welcoming classrooms and communities for those children and their families. So that's sort of what the work is that we're talking about today in the webinar. Um, Carrie McCluskey is currently a master's student in the Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Winnipeg and University of Manitoba. It's a joint program, as is Kirby Borgard. And Kirby and Carrie have been working with me for the past uh, three or so years 
in terms of doing various research tasks. So I wanted to give them an opportunity to share with you and the audience listening today um, from their perspective what they've learned along the way. And what we will hear from the webinar is some of the thematic areas that emerged in the research. You're also going to hear how we responded to what the field asked us for. The field asked us for practical strategies for supporting teachers. So that's essentially what we've developed in this, in this new book called Bridging Two Worlds, Supporting Newcomer and Refugee Students. So we've really tried to say, okay, these are thematic areas that emerge. In the middle section of the book, we're actually saying we wanna build teacher capacity, so we're developing lessons that now we can implement in all these different contexts in terms of training teachers and counselors. And now we're finding there's also applicability to settlement workers. And then the third part of the book is we said, well, we've done some teaching of teachers. Now let's take a look at how we can build more capacity in our students. So we decided that the career development framework and taking a look at the blueprint life work designs was a really good conceptual and theoretical framework for upon which we could build these lessons to fit the needs of students in a K to four background in a five to eight classroom and also in a nine to 12. So you'll hear about different examples that we've developed to satisfy those needs as well. So I'm going to now turn it over to Carrie and Kirby to now fill you in on the, the background, a little more of the background of the research and also how all of this developed. And hopefully you will find it useful. And we'd really love to hear from you as well from the field, telling us what works, what doesn't work, how you change things, adapt things, because we see this as a work in progress and something that we can continue to develop. And we are implementing it in a variety of different contexts now and learning from that. So we assist, we, we need your assistance to help us do that. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, my name is Kirby Borgert and um, Carrie and I are going to be uh, facilitating this webinar with you today and we're really happy to be here um, to share um, this research. So um, just a little bit of our goals for today, we're gonna to be looking at this research project, um, as well as talking about some trends in terms of refugee resettlement and challenges that um, refugees face in resettling in Winnipeg in Canada, um, how to work from a trauma-informed perspective, as well as how to build competency in teachers, uh, school counselors, as well as service providers, um, in addition to children and youth in terms of career development. Um, so let's start looking at the research project. So before I start, um, I know I'm talking to preaching to the choir here, but I always like to start presentations off just clarifying the difference between an immigrant and a refugee because um, they do have different migration routes and it's just really important that when working with newcomers, you really have a good understanding of the difference between um, an immigrant and a refugee. So an immigrant is a person who chooses to move from their home country and resettle, resettle in a new country. Um, so they're prepared to leave, they decide where they're going to move to, they decide when they're going to leave, and they are able to save money, start to do some research on their new community, as well as say goodbye to family and friends. Um, a refugee, on the other hand, is someone who's forced from their home as a result of war, persecution, or because of natural disaster, and so they really are not prepared to leave their home, and for many would love to stay at home, but they're unable to um, because the only alternative would be death. Um, so in terms of the goals and purpose of this research project, um, there are various programs and services that have been introduced to Canada to address the career development of newcomers, but specifically looking at adults. Um, and there's a lack of research that examine the middle and secondary levels of career decision making, particularly when it comes to looking at refugee children and youth. Um, so research in Canada tends to focus on the educational needs of refugee children, and there was a void that was noted in terms of the um, adequate career development programs um, and services available for refugee children and youth in terms of career development. Um, so this research was designed to look specifically at what educators, school counselors, and service providers could do to better foster um, and facilitate informed career decision making for newcomer refugee children and youth. Um, and it's important to provide um, school counselors, teachers, and service providers with this knowledge um, to ensure that their better informed and culturally responsive career development and guidance programs are available for newcomer uh, youth. 
Um, so as mentioned in the introduction by Dr. Stewart, um, this research was conducted across three cities in Canada um, and include several stakeholder, stakeholders, which were scholars, practitioners, um, government representatives and community organizations that helped provide the foundation for this um, long-term research program. Um, and together, the interdisciplinary exchange of knowledge contributed to the enhanced understanding of the complex needs associated with career development around um, newcomer and refugee children um, and allowed for a better framework for best practices and principles that have the potential to uh, improve the capacity of career development um, for, for us, for those who work with uh, uh, newcomer children and youth. Um, we're going to talk about trends and challenges just briefly. So um, at the end of 2016, UNHCR concluded there were 65.6 million people who were displaced around the world as a result of war, persecution, violence, um, or because of human rights violations. So that number has actually increased uh, since the picture on your screen, which was the end of 2015. Um, so by 2016, 65.6 million people were forcibly displaced. And that breaks down to being 22.5 persons who identify as refugees, uh, 40.3 individuals who count as internally displaced people, as well as 2.8 asylum seekers. And UNHCR also identified that 51% of the refugee population is children under the age of 18. Um, conflict scars everyone involved, but ch children are particularly vulnerable when it comes to witnessing these atrocities and the impact of war can negatively um, shape who they are as adults if proper supports are not in place. Um, as the world changes, Canada continues to be a safe destination for many families who have been impacted by conflict um, through resettlement. And it's important that our schools and our community organizations are prepared to meet the needs of refugee children and youth. Um, so youth who come from countries where civil war has been in existence for most, if not all their lives, have unique needs. Um, and tremendous adjustment challenges after locating to Canada. And when these needs are not met, they can be easily become disengaged from their social networks. Um, and Justice has said that once we use, lose youth from our schools, it will be about six months until they're entrenched in the justice system. Um, disenfranchised youth are obviously more vulnerable to being recruited into uh, gang activity, drug and alcohol use, as well as criminal activity. Um, and there has been a an abundance of talk about refugee issues, but there's, there's been a lack of action in terms of direct supports um, for the long-term benefit of newcomers. Um, most of the programs that are in existence depend on literacy, numeracy, and language development, and lack of there, there's a lack of programming that focuses on psychological and social development, which is a key factor in helping uh, children come from more affected backgrounds. Um, Overall, there's been a piecemeal approach to supporting newcomer children and youth. Um, there are some really great programs out there that are existing and are working well, but then there are areas where there's still no programming available. Um, so Canada needs a long-term uh, strategy to help meet their needs. Um, so when working with newcomers and refugees, it's important to remember that there are multiple, multiple challenges that they face. Um, it's not as simple as just learning English. Uh, there, there are several factors that they face and experience daily that, that kind of hinder or can hinder their uh, successful integration into our communities. Um, and that is family stress, educational um, issues, environmental issues, racism, discrimination, as well as trauma and psychosocial issues. So unfortunately, due to time, I'm not going to be able to talk a lot about these, but in terms of family issues, um, you know, families, when they first settle, have to adjust to social and cultural norms. There's new rules for disciplining, uh, learning about the systems in Canada, so adjusting to uh, new levels of poverty. Uh, many families come and are given a, a small amount of money um, from the government who come from government sponsored, and they have to find a housing for their family, feed their family with little income. And so that can really put a lot of stress on families. Um, many children who come from more affected backgrounds have uh, disrupted schooling, so may have never gone to school before or have been out of school for several years and find themselves put into a, a school environment that is very new to them. Um, within that school system, there's various levels of assistance from teachers. So for some teachers, they are very understanding and accommodating to newcomer, newcomer learners. Um, but there are teachers as well that it say it's my way or the highway. Um, in addition, there are many other responsibilities that newcomer children have in terms of providing childcare for their family, um, working another job, helping at home. And those are all factors that can um, hinder their success in education. 
Um, in terms of environmental, this is kind of just an, an overall theme. So if you think about weather, many of the refugees who resettle in Canada come from warm climates. Um, if anyone lives in a place where it gets to be minus 40, that can be a huge adjustment on families. Um, so we work very closely with families to help them understand how to dress warm for winter. What are appropriate clothing? How do you keep your house warm without cranking the heat? Those are all things that they need to start to learn about as they're living in Canada. Um, unfortunately, racism and discrimination is prevalent in our communities. Um, Canada is not immune to the xenophobic rhetoric that has um, sort of spread across the global north over the last several years. Um, and that is in terms of discrimination and racism from the law enforcement, as well as within our school systems, employment sector, as well as the greater community. And so that's something that many uh, newcomers face quite often. Um, and the psychosocial issues um, resulting from traumatic experiences can exhibit themselves quite um, uh, in, a, in a quite a, a different variety of ways, including emotional distress, feeling lonely, being afraid of the stigma associated with mental health and thus being afraid to get help because maybe you'll be sent back home um, or you don't want to be crazy. Um, and we're going to talk about that in the next section as well when I talk about trauma. So I just want to read a quote for you. It says, um, I do not know if anyone really knows war until it lives inside of them. A person can come in and see the war, fear the war, be scared of the violence, but their life, their very being is not determined by the war. This is my country, the country of my parents, my family, my friends, my future. And the war has gotten into all of these, for I can never leave the war. I will carry the war with me. So it's just important to remember that once um, newcomers resettle, the trauma does not end. The trauma continues and as that quote says, lives with them every day. Um, so trauma initially comes from the Greek word meaning wound, which referred to a physical injury um, that took place but was later adapted to include um, psychological trauma. Uh, so the definition of trauma is a response to a stressful experience in which a person's ability to cope has been threatened. It can be a one-time event or an ongoing experience that happens continuously. Uh, trauma can be experienced either directly or indirectly, indirectly referring to the fact that you might witness a traumatic experience or you might hear it from a close family or friend. Trauma impacts everybody, but the responses that each person has to trauma can vary um, and it can happen immediately following the traumatic event or long term down the line um, after that experience has happened. Um, refugee children who have been exposed to conflict are at greater um, risk for experiencing psychological issues and having further traumatic experiences from those. Um, so trauma can have a debilitating effect on how people respond and how they function and how they see themselves in the world because once a traumatic experience has happened, it challenges a person's sense of safety. So they're constantly feeling threatened because uh, they've been undermined. So trauma can impact our body in several different ways. Um, and we can have physical, cognitive, emotional and behavioral responses to that traumatic experience. So physical responses include things like um, having stomach aches, muscle tensions, nightmares, or loss of appetite. Um, cognitive issues might include having memory loss, poor judgment, feeling helpless, out of control, um, or feeling that the world is unsafe. Um, emotional issues include things like sadness, anxiety, depression, fear, um, as well as post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and behavioral issues can include themselves, can show themselves in a variety of ways, including withdrawing, being aggressive, um, having social and interpersonal issues, as well as engaging in risky behavior. Um, somatization is when an emotional distress manifests itself in a physical ailment, which has no medically backed reason. Um, and it's important to keep that in mind because many um, people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds are likely to present physical ailments when they have emotional distress. And that's because traditionally the physical and the mental capacity in people is seen to be connected and to be as one. So um, an emotional, emotional distress is not easily um, interpreted in different languages. So if you think of things like trauma, depression, mental health, there are some languages where those words just don't exist. Um, and so many individuals might ex express uh, somatization and they're actually unaware of the emotional needs that they have and the physical symptoms that they are experiencing. Um, so when trauma is unresolved, um, in, individuals will often feel unsafe, they feel disconnected, 
they're unable to self-regulate, and they're unable, they, they live in a constant um, freeze, flight, or flight response. Um, they're constantly hypervigilant, so they're constantly on the lookout to protect themselves from, a, from another traumatic uh, reoccurrence, and they feel helpless. Um, so participants in this research refer to something called a triple trauma effect, which is a trauma that's experienced through the pre-migration, transmigration, as well as post-migration phase. Um, so trauma experienced um, through the, the pre-migration stage would be a uh, breakdown in their social networks at home, disrupted schooling, as well as experiencing direct violence and persecution because of conflict. Um, transmigration uh, trauma might be experienced through the, the journey and the trajectory towards their flight for safety. Um, it could be life in a refugee camp where um, they're most likely marginalized and treated very poorly, in addition to living in very harsh living conditions. Um, this could be disruption to family and social connections. So your family has fleed separately. You don't know where people are. Uh, you're experiencing a lot of loss during that time, as well as the possibility of maybe being resettled in a country such as Canada. Um, these are all sort of psychological things that are going on in their mind during that transmigration phase. Um, and lastly, it's important to also consider the trauma that is experienced during the post-migration phase, which means when they're resettled in a new country. Um, and those types of trauma can come from things like trying to learn a new language, dealing with the financial um, constraints that families have, feeling isolated, um, you know, experiencing problems with housing and education and employment, um, a, loss, a further loss of family and community supports, as well as concern for those left behind or loved ones that are still overseas. Um, and so as, as teachers and counselors and service providers, it's important for us to be aware of this triple trauma effect and realize that trauma can continue to happen once they have been resettled. Um, and in order for us to mitigate the, this trauma, we need to make sure that we're providing uh, supports and helping them to integrate. So trauma-informed practice or trauma-informed values is an approach that um, involves understanding, recognizing, and responding to the effects of all types of trauma. So it's, it's helpful really when you're working with any person, any child, any adult, any newcomer, any Canadian, any Indigenous person. Um, everyone has experienced trauma and, and working from a trauma-informed practice can really help to um, mitigate continuous trauma from occurring. So every system and every organization has the potential to re-traumatize people and interfere with recovery and healing. So a trauma-informed practice does not mean that we treat trauma symptoms, but rather we commit to providing um, supports and services in a manner that is welcoming and appropriate to the unique needs of individuals affected by trauma. So having an awareness of how, uh, how trauma impacts people is essential to the healing process and working from a trauma-informed perspective um, helps us to engage in um, a welcoming and appropriate environment, ensuring that they feel safe and um, welcomed. Um, at its core, trauma-informed model replaces the idea that clients are sick or that they're resistant or uncooperative or bad. Um, and instead, we look at it as being an injury, an injury as a result of trauma. So viewing trauma as an injury and behavior as, a, as, a, as an injury shifts the conversation from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. So instead of saying, why are you being like this? We need to reframe it and say, what has happened to this person to make them act like this? Um, Trauma-informed care, trauma care provides the system, so whether that's an agency, a school, an organization, with the understanding of how trauma impacts children and youth, but also all individuals. Um, and it's important to recognize that trauma, this trauma-informed perspective, because at its core is um, genuine, authentic, and compassionate relationship building. Um, there are five core like, care values that um, form the solid foundation of trauma-informed care, which are safety, trust, empowerment, um, uh, collaboration, and choice. And so regardless of anything, ensuring a sense of safety is required and trust is, is necessary in order to build a sense of belonging and start to successfully integrate in our schools and our communities. Um, and if safety and um, trust are not met, uh, individuals will continue to remain in that fight, flight, or free stage, and little learning and understanding can take place. Once a sense of state safety has been established, um, there's a sense of trust that is able to happen and a sense of belonging starts to form. And with this belonging comes collaboration, trust, and choice. Um, and so these care values are particularly important to vulnerable children, children with um, interrupted education, as well as children who come from more affected areas. 
So there are several factors that you can keep in mind um, when working with individuals from a trauma-informed perspective. And those factors are, um, the first one is recognizing that behavior is typically the first sign of an underlying concern. So it's important to remember that behavior are, are, is not done to be a bad person, but behavior is a way that people use to communicate something. Um, so rather than viewing behavior as a child being uh, resistant, bad, or uncooperative, try to determine what the child is trying to communicate to you with that behavior. Um, the second one is respect the individual and his or her journey. Um, every child in their experience will be unique, and what works for one child or youth will not necessarily work for another. Oops. Um, the third one is to begin at the beginning. So children who have experienced trauma often lack appropriate coping strategies um, to help calm themselves during difficult and different situations. Um, and so we need to really work with children about the common situations that they might encounter and appropriate ways to respond to those situations safely. Um, the fourth one is to be flexible. So this means um, in terms of your planning for your approaches, the supports you're providing and building a relationship. Um, relationship is the is a key to the solid foundation of, of learning. Um, and lastly, ask for assistance. So let the child guide you in determining what is needed to support that child. So it might be that just because they're in school now, um, they're still not feeling safe. And until they feel safe, they will not be able to start doing math. And we really need to let the child determine what their learning path will be. Um, and we also need to seek guidance from the family, from our community, Peer, uh, professional peers, as well as the support staff available. And I'm now going to turn it over to Carrie, who's gonna to talk to you about um, building competencies. Hi everybody, I'm Carrie, and I'm gonna join you for the remainder of the presentation as we talk about the um, themes for best practice that developed, as Dr. Stewart had mentioned, as well as um, the career development practices that we've integrated into the, the outcomes of the project. So our first theme is conflict awareness. And we find it's critical that educators and service providers are familiar with the situations that these youth are coming from and what their experience has been. Um, this awareness is key in building positive relationships with youth and being able to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health and of learning concerns that may need additional help. Recognizing these signs will help reduce incidents of violence, exclusion, bullying, and absenteeism, and really allow us to create a safe space where we can foster resilience. Our next theme is social determinants. And it kind of stands to reason, common sense, that if um, basic human needs aren't being met, it's going to be difficult to participate in a daily work day or, <clears throat> pardon me, in a school day. So being aware of inequities that families face, as well as barriers or difficulties that they might experience in accessing services can help us to refer appropriate resources and make sure that needs um, such as food, housing, and healthcare are taken care of that allow us to um, em engage in other practices for, for a positive experience. Our next theme is peace and sustainability. Building relationships, this is a theme you've heard from Kirby and you're gonna hear it a lot more as we continue today will help us understand root causes of troubled behavior and avoid misunderstandings. Engagement in restorative practices ensure teaching opportunities can occur while still maintaining the integrity of relationships. What we really want to remember is that some of our students are coming from situations where their migration experience has um, left them very distrustful of authority and adults. And that's something that we're going to have to work to restore and restorative practices can create space for this learning to happen. Being aware of refugee characteristics uh, is another one of the emerge, uh, themes that emerged. Understanding some of the characteristics of refugee youth can help us to respond appropriately, particularly when behavior concerns are attributed to things like negative experience during migration, again, that distrust, or maybe safety concerns that they've had, as well as gaps in learning or interrupted social development. Um, these factors can contribute to heightened displays of stress and anger, and this is something that we want to be very sensitive and mindful when we respond to, to be sure that we don't damage relationships and that we're able to keep them in our care um, and provide the necessary supports and services. So building community connections is probably the greatest asset we can bring ourselves, whether we're educators or service providers. It basically means that we don't have to do it all on our own. 
So when we foster positive relationships in the community, we can supply additional resources that provide kind of round the clock care in a holistic manner, but we also build belonging and positive connections with youth and their families in the community. A recommendation here would also to be engaged the use of cultural brokers to assist in school and the community with uh, resources that may be, need to be accessed as well as um, communication and help with language. Developing cultural competencies. The very root of this is really everything we're talking about in terms of um, building relationships. And culturally responsive practices basically are just creating that safe space where students have an opportunity to express themselves and that their, their stories are valued and heard in the process. At the end of this section, I'm going to share just a brief activity that can build community within a classroom through um, storytelling and ways that we, you can adapt it to fit the, the student body in your room or the groups that are in your, your service care. Trauma sensitivity and mental health awareness. I'm not gonna talk a whole lot about this because I think Kirby's covered it very well, but it is really key that we not necessarily need to be the responder to all crisis trauma and mental health, but that we do um, have an awareness and an understanding of what this might look like and what the outcomes and possibilities of the effects are on, on the, the people that are in our care. Uh, the one place I would like to just draw attention to, because it's something I think we don't always think of um, in, in a broad sense, is the loss that some of these newcomers will face coming and, and resettling and that it's not just about leaving your country it's also about leaving a sense of culture it's about leaving the food you know the people you know um, family and those who may be still in the conflict zone but left behind that we're thinking that remain in the thoughts of of the newcomers here so none of us can do it alone and self-care is really a key component in being able to appropriately and responsibly engaged with those we're trying to help. There is definitely a risk of not doing it very well if we don't take care of ourselves first and really support um, the idea of self-care. So it's so important that teachers and service providers find ways to manage their own stress levels by creating their own networks of support as well as engaging in enjoyable activities and finding time to, to find enjoyment in life in high stress situations. The cost of being a compassionate caregiver is extremely high so self-care remains a key factor in avoiding vicarious trauma or burnout due to compassion fatigue. So career planning and development is a final theme that emerged in terms of best practice for educators and service providers. So it's just shared here as one of the themes. Um, I'll just make note that career development is one of the primary ways that schools and communities can engage in, in practices together in supporting all youth. And we're going to get a little bit more into that shortly. So why is it so important for youth to engage in practices? Sorry, why is it so important for schools to engage in practices that support newcomer youth? It is very likely that schools offer the most consistent space for students on a day-to-day -day basis, and they act as a connection point as well for community groups and agencies. This can have a profound impact on integration experience and success. As Kirby had mentioned, there are many, many service providers and educators that embrace the opportunities to help all of their students, but there are some that make it difficult to, um, for the students to want to engage. So it's really important that we make sure that we provide the best possible experience and the necessary supports so we can have positive outcomes all around. So what does this look like? If we break it down and look at it in a very practical sense, building res culturally responsive space looks like this. One, we want to get to know the stories of our students. And on our part, there's some homework to be done in terms of understanding where they come from and what their um, experience has been. So understanding that not everybody coming from a, a particular conflict zone will have the same experience. And even those that come from the same conflict or from the same family will experience these things differently. So taking time to get to know each of the students allows you to understand what it is that they'll need from you and understanding their hopes and goals for the future kind of gives us a plan in terms of stepping stones to move forward. Understanding ourselves is also very key in building culturally responsive um, spaces. 
we are surrounded every day by people's stories and media and um, we form biases, whether we mean to or not, and sometimes we form assumptions. So having an understanding of where we're coming from and why we think the way we do and how our experiences have shaped us, um, we can better engage with those around us. So part two of getting to know our students is the relationship building component. So engaging with the students to understand where they come from and what their stories are in a sensitive and mindful way. We're not looking to date to, to re-traumatize anybody. We're just looking to, to build that core relationship. Some of this can involve getting to know some of the customs and traditions and maybe making space and time to share some of that within the classroom. And again, understanding what their hopes and goals are from their own perspective um, and how they would like to encourage that. So as I said, relationship building is a, a theme that, that's present throughout this presentation. So here's just a few quick tips to think about in terms of building relationships with young people. And the first is be authentic, and I think this is key. We're asking young people who have come out of likely traumatic experiences to open up and trust us and share their experiences with us. And to do that, we need to be available and open to maybe sharing a little bit of ourselves. It also involves asking for help when we need it, which can sometimes be hard, but it's really in everybody's best interest if we're able to recognize our strengths and limitations and um, reach out for other resources when necessary. Establishing trust, of course, is the baseline for any nurturing relationship. Again, with these youth, if they're coming from situations where trust has been damaged, this is going to be a key component to moving forward. Strong communication is definitely key. The need for some basic counseling skills was was part of the themes that, that emerged from the research. And the, the biggest piece of that is really just listening and attending to students' needs and students' stories and being present and available. Um, when conflict does arise, looking for those restorative practices, but taking the time to resolve it and moving on so young people can understand it's okay to make mistakes and it's okay to try again. There's no, no harm done. Patience. Patience is key, and I think I heard Kirby mention patience as well when we're, we're talking about a trauma-informed classroom. The experiences that some of our young people have had that brings them here today have happened sometimes over many, many years. This isn't something that we can reverse in a matter of minutes or a matter of days or a matter of weeks, and there needs to be patience in the process of um, reintegration and settlement. And negative behavior when it does occur, as Kirby said, is probably happening for a reason. So, you know, not taking it personally. It's not, it's not meant to offend you. It's just dealing with the situation or a day in that moment. We want to maintain expectations and be consistent with all youth. And again, these are strategies that aren't just about newcomer youth, but working with effectively with all youth. Um, in particular, maintaining expectations that are relative to the needs and abilities of each of our students. You know, we, we want to expect good things, high things, developmental things from our students, and we want to keep them building and, and encourage growth. Um, being consistent on what we say and following through on what we say, very important. And again, knowing our limits and where our buttons are and knowing to step back when we need help or when that self-care piece um, is, is something that's, that's important to engage in for ourselves. Building on problem solving strategies, this refers again to the theme of the restorative practices, taking the time to, to build and learn and address um, cultural differences that may contribute to behavior and taking those all as learning opportunities. Recognizing our own bias and valuing the experience of others is key in building relationships and avoiding groupthink. So being careful of, again, those biases and those stories and assumptions that kind of become ingrained with us just by participating in the world in everyday ways. And of course, be nice. And it's, it, it is oversimplified, but it's such a critical component. A smile can go a long way to somebody who's feeling nervous or um, just apprehensive. So moving on into the career development component, um, this is the final section of the book that was developed. And what we did was take the, um, I forget the name of it. We've created a document out of the existing Blueprint for Life 
um, and suggested many activities that can be incorporated into everyday day-to-day -day practices for teachers in the classroom. So the Canadian standards for career guidelines outline the core competencies related to career development. Three of these competencies include interpersonal competence, which includes respect for diversity and effective communication, career development knowledge, which describes how life roles and values imp impact career development, and also the importance of keeping current about labor, labor market and diversity issues. And the, the last one we're gonna just add on for today is needs assessment and referral. And that simply just addresses the need to um, respond effectively and appropriately to client needs and also develop a network of resources to have at our disposal and to make appropriate referrals when necessary. So this is kind of one of the key pieces that we want to address with this section of, of the research or these outcomes of the research is challenging the idea of jobs and career. So understanding through experience, as we're going to talk about through some of these um, slides coming up, that there is a difference between a job and a different between difference between career. And sometimes exposure is what can give you ideas for things that you would like to do for your life and build. And that career development is a lifelong process. It is not just about resumes and interviewing and filling out applications, although those are excellent skills to be prepared with. Um, the development happens from day one and continues throughout our lifetime. So what we want to do is really encourage emphasis on personal development career exploration, and career discovery. In today's world, career discovery can definitely be a very exciting um, adventure. So what we've done is created um, a curriculum with integrative lessons and suggestions for supporting career development in students from K to 12. The lessons are broken down into early, middle, and senior years and provide samples um, that can be integrated in the classroom or in the, in the um, Oh my goodness, in the community um, for different organizations. So what, what we've tried to do is establish belonging by connecting to homeschool and community with some of these activities and really encourage that participation in the community. Um, the guide also provides opportunity to see and interact with individual, individuals who share experience <clears throat> and have already found um, success. So individuals who have maybe followed the same path or come from the same regions as some of our youth and are finding success in the community as um, employers or are employed or can provide mentorship opportunities. We're looking to build intrinsic skills and motivation and well-being with the youth in, as they connect with themselves in this explorative um, opportunity. So by focusing on building interpersonal skills in the youth, we support the development of meaningful interpersonal relationships and connections. So the Blueprint for Lifework Designs is not meant to be exclusive to education, although um, this research is firmly grounded in education. It really is um, about best practice for all youth in all areas of the community and in schools. Um, again, I just want to really, really clarify that this is not meant to be a make work project, especially for teachers. This is not something else that's to be added to the day that teachers are to work into their classrooms. I know we're all, you know, kind of stretched for time and, and energy. This is meant to make life a little bit simpler by building on the career development capacities and to be a catalyst for youth for thinking about careers through inquiry and participation. So here's the kind of a really, really quick snapshot of what it looks like. The blueprint contains 11 competencies throughout the different um, age levels. And they all have a different focus. And of course, their focus um, happens across the different grade levels in different ways. The kinds of things that we're looking at is knowledge of, of individual likes and dislikes, examining who you are. And it sounds like a simple thing, but sometimes just taking the time to kind of understand yourself without the influence of others can be um, quite an activity. So what is it you like? What do you dislike? What would you like to be? What are your experiences? What are you, how are your experiences shaping you through life and how does that change as you move towards the grade levels? What you think you'd like to do or who you are in the early years may change dramatically as you move through the middle years in high school. Um, Decision-making, having the autonomy to be able to make decisions 
and engage in the community in ways that promote independence and growth can be very key. And that's also some of the focuses that we're looking at here. Um, so we do also, of course, encourage those, those job work, job search skills, but really the focus is on that independent personal growth um, and engaging with the community, learning as a, as a lifelong condition that just promotes wellness and happiness as you continue throughout life and prepare, prepares you hopefully for the next step for smooth transitions. So I just wanna share a couple of um, brief activities that are included in the handbook. Um, I'll give you a, a small overview of these and then we'll work ourselves into questions if anybody has any questions. So lesson 24 is meant as a lesson for teachers as well as students and it's called Artifact Storytelling. And what this is, is a wonderful opportunity for a classroom or a group of people to come together and share an item of importance to them. And through just a few minutes of going around a room and having everyone share an item um, and a little bit of their story, it can be a really powerful and effective way to build those personal connections and relationship and building community within that space. Now, of course, as always, we wanna be very mindful of where our students are coming from. And if we have youth that are in part of our group that um, may not have items with them due to their transition and their experience, then we can change this up a little bit. And this can be about sharing anything. It can be about sharing a dance, a song, food, anything that, that's a, an important piece of them that they're willing to share. We also wanna be sensitive that um, sharing is optional and that maybe um, there's an opportunity to opt out if that's, if that's a choice. So the other um, activity I'd like to share with you is the Garden of Difference. And this is an activity in the Career Development Guide. So what this is, is cutouts of flower petals. So one side of your paper should be a, a bright color or a pattern or anything that will really draw attention to the eye once everything kind of collages together. And these petals are handed out to the students. On the back of the petal, for their eyes only, they can share or not share. That is, that is always a choice. Um, they can write something about themselves that makes them feel different or maybe disconnected or like they don't quite belong. And at the end of the, the activity, all these petals can come together onto a display board or, or a wall or wherever, wherever you choose. And they create a beautiful garden with all these different patterns. And we see how a very um, effective visual of how all of these petals come together to create something really beautiful, specifically through their differences. So through this activity, you were able to look at things like um, self and finding value in self, as well as respect and tolerance and flexibility and honesty and just positive relationships within the group. And again, building that sense of community that's based on differences as well as respect. So I think there I'll hand it over to Zuhur and you will go ahead with some questions. Absolutely. And the first question is from Nikki. She asks, what types of resources are available to students who have this triple trauma effect? So I think in terms of resources, it would really depend on what your community has available and what your school has and where you're kind of coming from. Um, in terms of resources, I would, I mean, there's in terms of, of adult supports to students, there's a lot of things on the internet in terms of trauma-informed care. There's also a lot of trainings um, in addition to Circle of Security, which are really good um, options for professional development as, a, as an adult in working with, with children and youth who have trauma. Um, referring for supports, again, it would really just depend on what resources you have available within your communities. Do you have anything you wanna to add to that? No, I think that's that's pretty good. Yeah, you just kind of have to do uh, like a check to see what are the referral type, like what what is the process for referring? Um, how do you get connect? How do you get them connected? Um, is there something that you can do on site? Because sometimes an issue might be trust and and going to sort of like a counseling. Um, people may not feel comfortable doing that. I hope that answers your question. All right. Yes. Okay. And there's another question whereby um, the individual deals with a lot of adult students and they were wondering 
um, how or what applicable strategies can be used towards adult students versus younger, um, earlier child children in this predicament? Is this in terms of career development or in trauma? Um, I think it would be for both. Okay. I would say in terms of career development or even academics, again, it comes down to um, the relationship building and building that, that trust and that safe space in, in the culturally responsive and mindful way. Um, it really can never be underestimated to start with relationship. And I think if there's anything that we we do well in terms of misses, that relationship has to be that key piece, but also keeping the education relevant. So there's um, there's an understanding of what the end goal is. So in particular with adults, there can be a lot of frustration around still being in school when you're you're wanting to kind of get out there and get into the world and get on with it, but but supporting yourself in a, in a way that's meaningful and not just trying to, you know, work three jobs to make ends meet. So in that way, some of these community connections and things like mentorship and internships and apprenticeships can be really valuable in connecting not only for later job prospects or career prospects, um, but in helping to understand that, that all this work that's happening in an academic sense is leading towards an end goal. Um, in terms of the trauma piece, I think that it's firstly really important to keep in mind that uh, adults and parents and older siblings also have trauma um, and to keep that in mind when working with them. Um, and um, my expertise is specifically in working with children and, and youth. Um, but I mean, I, I would feel confident in saying that the approaches to, from a trauma-informed lens would be very transferable to working with um, adolescents who have, or, or older adults who have experienced trauma. Um, th the only thing that I would maybe take into consideration is um, their, um, independence. So working with children and youth, you would have a different approach than you would working with a, you know, a 30 year old male adult who has a lot more experiences than a 15 year old child or youth. All right. And from Desiree, um, is there specific strategies to employ when working with refugee children and youth experiencing mental health disorder? Um, it has been one year since working with Syrian children and youth, and it's still not easy for some of the workers, I guess, at her workplace, but not much changes in behavior and violence still too much, and some are not um, responding in ways that are constructive. So maybe I'll just step in. Um, the two things that I would recommend is, well, three things actually, is firstly is, is Dr. Stewart has um, two really well um, published books in terms of supporting uh, newcomers, children and youth. So one focuses on more on uh, the mental health aspect and psychosocial supports. And then this one also looks at career development. However, it does have several factors as Carrie mentioned um, that is not just in terms of developing career capacity, but also in, in the lifelong individuals. Um, so I would for sure look at those resources because within those resources, there are ample um, lessons and activities that could be based off to start to work towards that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, if, even if you just Google um, trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed care, there's a lot of resources that come up in terms of, of school programs. And maybe there are things that you can do within your school or with your workplace um, to be, you know, practice more of a trauma-informed care. Um, just from personal experience in terms of dealing with um, children and youth who come from more affected areas in terms of behavior, um, you need to have a relationship first in order for that um, connection to go anywhere, um, you know, kind of just things like having established routines. I'm not sure in terms of like how you deal with behavior, but also maybe the approach to the behavior, um, but also just looking at some of the like more into trauma informed care as well as possibly circle of security, if that's something that is applicable and just kind of getting a better understanding of what are the needs of the children, because you know, I'm a service provider and we work with many Syrians and it can be very frustrating when you're working with, with families who have trauma as yourself because what you're doing is not working and, and you just need to really step back and, and breathe and realize, as Karen mentioned, this is not gonna happen in a day, in a month, maybe in a year. These are our experiences that have severely altered them as individuals and it's piece by pieces approaches to rebuilding them and their understanding of the world. 
No, I think you covered it really well. The only thing I would caution against is also being aware of the signs of vicarious trauma. And I, I would support maybe looking into um, how to recognize those signs, but also into how you can turn that around into uh, a vicarious resilience that can just be a more positive engagement for the service providers. Okay, perfect. And from Tracy, what are the three cities that were a part of the research? The, Winnipeg was one. Um, was Calgary and New Brunswick. Yeah. All right. And then this final question is a two-parter. Firstly, from MC Bailey, how to support? How do you support schools to engage more families? And the second part is, do you know of any Canadian schools who have a more wraparound education model for refugee parents, adolescents, and children? Okay, I, I'll speak um, a little bit to the families. Now, it's difficult actually to answer without knowing what the situation is or how the school en engages at the moment, or the schools in general, maybe. Um, cultural brokers are definitely one of the, the recommendations that that we make as a result of themes that have emerged. Um, and that could be formal in terms of hiring school liaisons that will engage in particular with students and their families. Um, and the school is kind of that bridge to, to fill any gaps or, or concerns. Um, the other is also bringing the families together at the school in ways where they can actively participate and feel value in what they have to offer. Um, the lack of language sometimes I think maybe makes us think that there's a lack of skill and that's just not a transferable relation. Um, so engaging with families as, as much as they're willing to engage can also be a wonderful way or having events at the school also that bring families and community together, whether that's about um, sharing some kind of arts expression or sharing meals like a potluck or something like that or celebrating cultural events within um, the schools and not so much like a uh, um, you know, a culture day kind of thing, but but meaningful ways that really show all students and families and cultures that they're they're valued and they're welcome. And I just want to quickly add, I know that we're coming to our conclusion. I think it's also important for um, schools and, and teachers to realize that culturally parent involvement in school is very different. And it really is on us as teachers, as as schools to make an environment welcoming and, and get that connection to the parents because they may not necessarily um, have that that understanding that I need to be more involved in my school. So as Carrie mentioned, like there's lots of ways to um, bring them in and get them involved, but also just realizing that it's not you know normal to have uh, parents go to schools and participate in parent teacher interviews or have parents come in and say, what are ways that we can support your children here? Oftentimes they look to us as teachers to have all the answers. And also, Carrie and I have our information posted on the PowerPoint, so if there are additional questions or if you had specific details to those questions that didn't get answered, uh, we're more, like, more, ha more than happy to receive emails and continue that conversation. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Kirby and Kari. Um, on your screen, you will find the URL to download your free copy of the book Bridging Two Worlds at sarek.ca Two Worlds. Hard copies are also available for purchase via Amazon.ca or chapters.indigo.ca. As mentioned at the webinar, at the beginning of the webinar, we will email you a link to the recording of this webinar along with a copy of the slides later today. Um, on your screen, you will be prompted to fill out a short survey at the end of this webinar. Please do take a few minutes to fill it out. We greatly value your feedback. You will also notice on your screen right now that we have an upcoming webinar and a couple of other free learning opportunities that may be of interest to you. With that, let me close by thanking you, the participants, for joining us at this webinar, and I hope to see you at another learning opportunity very soon. Take care and have a wonderful day.